on our Palm Sunday, but a little bit of a flare on spiritual warfare. You know, last week I preached on the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need to understand some of these things. You see, demons are fallen spirits. We know a third of them fell when they revolt. They're very real. It's a very real thing. Very real. It's a very real thing. Now, let me tell you, demons are jealous of us. Why? Because we get to sing the song of the redeemed. Redemption was never offered for them when they fell. And so it makes them kind of ticked off a little bit at God. So they're kind of mad at God, but they can't touch God. So because they can't touch God, guess who they attack? The children. I'm going to tell you, parents, if you're a parent, you already know this. If you're not a parent, I mean parents will defend their kids, love their kids. If you want to hurt a parent, hurt their kids. And that's the way the devils try to attack. But you know what? Your devils, demons, you may ignore them, but I can promise you right now they're not ignoring you. As a matter of fact, Jesus, again, I'm going to tell you, Jesus spoke more about giving than any other person in the Bible. Jesus spoke more about demons than any other person in the Bible. Now, aren't we supposed to be becoming like him? I mean, I don't think it's something that we should just ignore. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, it says the devil or the princes of this world would not have crucified the Lord Jesus if, if they would have known. They didn't know, but they wouldn't have crucified. Who crucified the Lord? The princes of the world. The devil crucified the Lord. We got to make sure we understand this, that we really get this and fill this in. But here's the thing is that demons, what they do is they have incredible power and ability to influence people. I'm going to tell you, that's quite an, uh, an influence that they actually crucified the Lord of glory. They crucified the Creator. Through what? Through demonic influence, demonic power. We have to recognize and know that this is real. But who has all power? Well, God has all power. Power all came from God. It began with God. He created and made every power. Romans 13, 1 says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And so if all power is of God, and, and Satan is certainly powerful, but we have to remember, Satan was a creation. God created him. All power is of God. It all comes from God. It was given by Him. Then it should be very, very clear who has all power. See, the power the devil has was given to him. And so God is the source of all power. And Satan never had a chance whatsoever against God when he fell. And so it's equally clear that we have to understand where power comes from. If you want power in life, if you want ability in life, you have to understand and recognize the source. Now, a lot of times people get more sidetracked on the resource than they do the source. A resource is just a re. It's not the real. It's not the one. But God has power and he gives power and he wants to give power to you and I. A scripture very seldomly ever looked at, but a very, very powerful word that I could preach all day off of this is John 12, 26. Jesus said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. You want to be honored by God? Serve Jesus. He said, if you serve me where I am, there you are. If you want to be honored, serve me. I will honor you. God wants to bring honor to you. And that's what I want to preach on this morning. I want you to understand and make the connection this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray and ask, Lord, that you would touch every heart and every life. That you would lead us and guide us and establish us and equip us, Lord, to know that you have empowered us, Lord. As your children, as your servants, you have empowered us in this life to be victorious in this life. To make us kings and priests, as your word declares. And so today, Father, we focus in upon you because you are all power and the source of all of that power. Let's pray for our children's church right now. So reach your hands out towards our children's church. Father, we bless all the wonderful kids that have been in children's service since 9 this morning. Those who came for the main service, Lord. We pray and ask that you bless our children, Lord. Bless our servants, our workers, our teachers, Lord. Bless them mightily today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 
All right, now let me tell you, from the very beginning, every follower at the new birth receives the power to become sons of God. We're going to break this down. I'm going to hit you, not normal the way I usually preach, but I'm going to hit you with quite a few scriptures this morning. And so get ready, amen? It's going to be like on steroids. You ready? John 1, 12 says, But as many as received him, them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but the will of God. How many of you are born again today? You're born not by flesh, not by blood, but by the will of God. God has a plan and a purpose, and he calls you to be not just a Christian, not just a believer, but to be a son or a daughter of God. All right, the second thing is children of God are commanded to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Scripture, Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You see, my Father will honor you. What does that look like? It looks like being strong. Uh, that word comes from endunomai. It means to, to, to be in. In is a powerful preposition that denotes a place. Uh, dino is the word that means to, to reproduce over and over and over. It comes from the Greek word dunamis. To be strong in who? In his power. Stand in his power. In the power, the Greek word kratos, which we get democracy from, which is power of the people. Here we're talking about the power of God and the power of heaven. And in his might. The Greek word there is iskus. Iskus comes from a word for power that is placed upon a king when he sits upon the throne. How many of you know you can be anybody, but when you become king and they put you on the throne, iskus comes over you? What is that? That's power. Do you know that kings only sit on the throne when they're ruling? Kings never sit on the throne any other time than when they're ruling. They don't sit there and eat their lunch. They don't sit there and carry on press conferences. They sit on the throne to rule. There's a power that God has, and he says, I want you to be strong in this same power, the power of my might, by putting on the whole armor of God. You know, armor is for close combat. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. So that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that's methodia in the Greek, which is the word we get what method from, that you may be able to stand against the methods of the devil. Now, I want you to realize the devil has methods that he attacks your life with. He has methods. You know, so many times people, I, I just want to be free. I just want to do my thing. I don't want to be a Christian because then I'm going to do this. Why do you do the same thing every Friday night? You get drunk every Friday night. You're not free. There's no freedom in that kind of lifestyle. God wants you to be able to stand up against the methods of the devil. And God will honor you. And what he does is you are empowered with God's power on the inside. And you are supernaturally clothed on the outside. Now, you know, I always tag and partner these previous sermons. This is what we talked about last week. You're filled with the Spirit. You're wall-to-wall -wall Holy Ghost on the inside. Jesus and His Word is one. A little dab won't do you. Either you got it or you don't. Eternal life is not about the, quality, the quantity, but about the quality of life. Either you're born again right now and Holy Ghost lives in you. If the Spirit of God lives in you and Jesus and His Word is one, then the Word of God lives in you. That's why I never memorize Scripture. I meditate upon it. Why? It's already in me. Where's it at? It's in my spirit, man. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. The flesh always takes resistance. It takes resistance to grow your flesh. The only way I grow muscle is by resistance. But there's no resistance in my spirit, man, because my spirit is on go and my flesh is on no. In the spirit, bam, when I touch the gas, it takes off. Why? Because that's the same spirit, Romans 8, that raised Christ from the dead. It dwells inside of me and it quickens my mortal body. Amen? Are y'all getting this? And so 2 Corinthians 4 says this. It says, but we have this treasure. We have it in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves. We are troubled on every side. How many of you have ever been troubled on every side? He said, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. Amen. We're persecuted, but we're not forsaken. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. Always bearing in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be present in our body. Amen? Amen. You've got that life in you. I didn't say you wouldn't be hit on every side, but spiritual warfare, we have to realize he died to give me life and power. 
This is why Jesus died. So many Christians, so many people in the world, they don't get it. Of course, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of them, lest they would already have received the glorious light of the gospel. So if there's a method that's blinding you, you're not going to see. I pray that the, the, the scales be lifted from people's eyes because all they have to do is see. Once they see the goodness of God, the Bible says all men would be saved. So don't tell me there's not a devil because all men are not saved. All people are not saved. But we have this power, the excellency of this inside. We're troubled, yes, but we're not in despair. We're, we might be perplexed. You might be going through something. But I want you to know that the life of Jesus is going to be manifest. Amen? And so we, as Christians, have this power, the excellency, it says, of this power. Where is it? It's in us. It's in us. Luke 17, I love this. They were looking for the kingdom, and Jesus said, Behold, the kingdom's not here or there, for the kingdom of God is within you. It's within you. The power, there's power over a kingdom. And so at Palm Sunday, uh, people were shouting for Jesus. They were shouting that he was king. Why? Well, there was a battle that was about to take place, but what might surprise you is who and where and what the battle was. You see, the battle was not, and please get me, please understand me, the battle has never been between God and Satan. I mean, it's like, you know, God's winning and then the devil's winning. And then God's winning, God won, he's always won, he's uncontested. With me, uncontested is the devil's never fought with God. There's never even been a fight. There's never even been a ring. But I didn't say there's never been a battle at all. Why? Because you and I are battling with him. You and I, we battle with him all the, all the time. We battle with him all the day. But the battle is not between Jesus and Satan either. It wasn't between God and Satan. It's not between Jesus and Satan either. There's a battle, but that battle is going on for us. You see, Jesus came as a champion for man. He came as a champion. Man needed a champion. The Bible talks about Jesus being the last Adam. He was the last. It didn't say he's the second Adam. It said he's the last Adam. He came in the flesh to defeat him that had the power over our flesh and to become our sin. Just like Goliath was calling for a champion, David came out after 40 days and championed the cause of Israel. Jesus came when in the fullness of time. He came and gathered all things together in heaven and on earth in himself so that at the fullness of time he could win this victory for you and I. And so Jesus championed our case and our case was death. How many of you realize you were born into death? You were born into death. Death is something natural in you. Uh, my wife was going through some of my baby stuff and she found a list of the first four words that I was that I ever spoke. What was the second word? Mine? No, it was no. The second word I learned to say was no. No. Now, I can probably tell you your parents didn't have to teach you how to say no and how to be selfish. As in you. That came with the first Adam, right? That came when you were born. You were born, not born again, you were born. That came, rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. How many of you have some rebellious kids? Amen, every one of you. Come on, don't be kidding me. Your kid ain't no better than my kids. They're rebellious. Amen. If your kid's name, last name Shala, that's especially, I saw Liz's hand go way up. And she's got the sweetest girl. But let me tell you, those girls need spankings. Amen. Mom and dad shaking their head. Why do you discipline a kid? Because you love them. The Bible says if you don't discipline them, they're a bastard. Huh? I'm just telling you what the Bible is. God loves us and he comes and he comes to champion our cause and our cause was death. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. We'll talk about that word quickening a little bit if we have time. And so Jesus came as the last Adam. He came to die as the last one of a sinful race so that a new creature, a new creation could come and emerge. You see, how powerful is it? How important was it? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he who knew no sin became our sin. It didn't say that he put a little sin on his shoulder. It says he became your sin. He didn't just die for your sin. He became your sin. He took your sickness in his body. 
He took those lashes on his back, one for every root cause of sickness. He died and became your sin. The Bible says that he was beyond recognition as he hung upon the cross. I always hate these little Jesus models who are hanging on a cross and they got three drops of blood on them. Let me tell you, he was scourged, he was beaten, but what was even worse than all is when he became our sin. And he cried, it is finished, it is done. What I've come to do, and I'm not going to get into that for next week, Jesus did, and he waited on God. 1 Corinthians 15, says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. He came and he quickened. So the last Adam died, and a new man came forth. And Jesus wasn't just raised from the dead. This is what I can't get over in so many churches. Jesus was not just raised from the dead. My daughter Hillary was raised from the dead. We prayed for her, and God raised her from the dead in front of a physician who witnessed it, who put, put her in the, in, and Ann in the, in the hospital because she was dead. But I'm going to tell you, my daughter's not a savior. But my daughter was raised from the dead. Let me tell you something about Jesus. Colossians 1.18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. Hillary was raised from the dead. Jesus was born from the dead. Huge difference here. Have you ever heard about that guy named Nicodemus? And Jesus said, You must be born again. He was born again. Why? Because Christ was born from the dead first. What was he? He was the begotten of the Father. Revelations 1, 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood, and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so Jesus died to restore man's position with God. He died as a redeemer. Adam lost position. He lost power. Jesus came as the last Adam to die for a sinful race, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen? All things become new. Jesus died to restore authority to man. Just like in Revelations, God wants to make us kings and priests. This is what the Word of God says. So there's a battle going on, but the battle has has always been between Satan and man. Satan and man. How many of you realize the devil is real? Raise your hand. How many of you realize there's a chance you may be in a battle? Raise your other hand. But I'm going to tell you, so many churches don't talk about it. So many people don't talk. Jesus spoke more about demons than any person in the Bible. I'm going to tell you, they're real, and we need to recognize this. And there's still a battle going on. But Jesus came as a man, and he defeated him. How did Jesus defeat the devil? Very simple, very plain. Obedience. He was obedient, even unto death. You see, Jesus defeated Satan. Now, uh, two Wednesday nights ago, we went in and kind of covered the difference between Jesus and Christ and Lord and the understanding of the order that they're placed in. Jesus is earthly, Christ is heavenly, Lord is a title. Jesus came as a man. What are you saying? I want you to get this. There is a man representing you in the Godhead. Did you hear me? That's, that's a powerful uh, revelation when you get it. I said there's a man. What kind of man? A man that's been through every trial, every test, tempted in every way common to man. A man represents us in the Godhead. You see, Jesus didn't come as God and do the works he did as God. He came as a man who was subject to the Holy Spirit, who received the Spirit without measure. And then he worked everything through his Spirit. Through his Spirit, man. It's powerful. So a man, Jesus Christ, was born of a woman, the Son of God, and he defeated Satan. A man did this. And then I love this at the very end where Jesus stands up and he makes this phrase. He says, all power is given unto me, both in heaven and earth. The next thing he tells his disciples, he says, go into the world and teach them to observe, baptizing them. All power, he said, go. What happens when you go? When you go, God said, I will honor you. I will honor you. It's kind of like this guy crying out in the Old Testament, Lord, Lord, I'll do anything. Lord, Lord, I'll do anything. Lord, send me. 
We need more Christians crying out, Lord, send me. Lord, use me. I will pray for somebody. I will prophesy to somebody. I will lay hands on somebody. I will pray for somebody. Lord, send me. Why? Because he said where he is, there you would be also, or wherever you are, he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you. This is a part of God honoring you. He said, I will honor you, I will be with you, I will be in you, you will not be disappointed. And so surely when God spoke this, when Jesus spoke this, surely in the minds of the disciples, in the minds of the people that heard him say this, they had to be thinking back and remembering this instance where Jesus gathered 70 other believers together with him, with his disciples. He gathered them together. What was common in that day is Jesus entered into a town, Jesus ministered, Jesus did the works, the people followed, the people watched. But this time, Jesus said, you go into the cities and come back to me. Very important. You go. He said, you go. Remember what he did? He sent them out by twos. He sent them out into the cities. And this is what happened in Luke chapter 10. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I have given you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written. Wow, man had never had authority over demons before. Man had never had this authority. And so when man comes back to report to Jesus, Jesus, you won't believe this. The devils were under our control. We had power and we had authority. How and why? Jesus gave them that power and that authority. But Jesus said, don't rejoice for a symptom. Don't rejoice for a symptom. Don't rejoice over a symptom. You see, this a symptom of your condition is that spirits are subject to you. That's a symptom of your condition. How many of you know your condition is greater than your symptom? Symptoms come out of conditions. You've got to understand the condition in order to work with the symptom. And this was the condition. He said, rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Rejoice because your name. Rejoice because you're a son. Rejoice because I've given power to you to be the sons of God. Don't rejoice because the stinking devil is under you. I saw that dude when he fell from heaven. Come on, y'all aren't helping me. I'm going to preach the other side. Y'all aren't helping me. This side's not helping me at all. He said, I've got power and I'm giving it to you. And guess what? He didn't even tell them all the power that they had. They went out and they discovered it on their own. And they came back and the first thing, Jesus, you're not going to believe this. Can you imagine ever telling Jesus and being surprised, Jesus, the devils were subject to us. What'd you say? The devils are, no, Jesus knew he had the power, he had the authority. I'm going to tell you right now, he's looking for people to give power and authority to. Why are you not that people? Huh? Come on. He's looking, he's looking for people. I'm going to tell you, the, the, the devils would try to approach Jesus and they would cry out and Jesus would forbid them to speak. Why did he forbid them? He didn't want the devil telling people who he was. When he sat before Peter, they said, who do men say? And they say, well, some say you're this prophet, that prophet. Peter, who do you say? You are the Christ. He said, Peter, flesh and blood's not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. You see, God has mysteries and secrets that he speaks to the heart of sons and daughters, that he reveals the mystery to, that he shows us ways where there seem to be no way. Excuse me, he is the way, and he is the only way, and he leads us into that light and that life that that light and that life might consume us and live on the inside of us. And so Jesus, who was in the form of a man, went into hell and he conquered every adversary. And when we see him on Palm Sunday, he's coming into the city amidst shouts of Hosanna. They're lifting up the name. Jesus said this, as you come to Jerusalem, he sent his disciples into the village to bring the the colt of a donkey, to bring a donkey colt with him. And Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this little colt. Something that kings would do when they came in peace. When they came in war, they rode a war horse. 
when they came in peace. If you ever pay attention to old movies and stuff, you'll always notice that the priest, the pastor, he's always riding a what? A donkey. You don't ever see a, a pastor riding on a big thoroughbred or a big war horse because he's coming in peace. Jesus entered Jerusalem not only on a donkey, but on the foal of a donkey. Never been ridden. Amidst shouts of Hosanna, 2 Kings 9, this is the way an entrance of a king was done. They were treating him as a king. Why? They were seeking a king. But you know what? Jesus didn't come to, to relieve them of great political or, or to be a great military leader or to, to relieve them of the tyranny of the Roman Empire because this kingdom is not of this world. It's bigger than this world. And so he entered in on a, on a colt, on a foal. Why? Because he was coming with peace. Why? Let me tell you this. Get this. He wasn't at war with the people. Jesus was not at war with the people. And when he came in, they were shouting, Hosanna, and they were laying their branches and taking their jackets off, laying them and strawing them in the way. Jesus was coming in peace. Why? Jesus came to serve man. That's the revelation if you get this. Again, I could preach forever on that. But he came to serve man. John 10, 11 and 10 says, But the enemy comes, the devil comes. What does he come to do? To steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I've come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. So we know there's an enemy out there, but Jesus didn't fight Satan in hell. He went to hell. Acts 2 said that, that he believed that God wouldn't suffer thine holy one to see corruption or to remain in hell. God quickened him, raised him up. We'll get to that. But when Jesus went into hell, he went in to pay a price. He went in as a redemption price. Now I'm going to tell you a powerful, and I don't often share this kind of stuff, but the Bible says that your young men will see vision. Your old men, I guess I'm getting to be old at 56, will dream dreams. I had a powerful dream the other night. Didn't understand it all. Almost kicked my wife out of the bed. When I dream, I'm always in a fight. I am a fighter. I love, well, I love to fight. And I had this weird, weird dream. And evidently, I don't know this, but Ann knows that I start growling. And when I start growling, it's time to wake up and to get out of the way. And so I'm all growling. I don't hear myself growling. I don't know I'm growling. Something happened I had never, ever seen in my life. It was so vivid and so plain. We woke up, we talked about it. And Ann said, you need to ask God what that is. I'm dreaming this, and I'm in this most beautiful place. Man, I mean most beautiful place. I start naming all the animals that were around us. It was absolutely amazing, absolutely beautiful. And then I noticed this wolf, and there was a lamb right next to me. And I'm watching, and there's nothing I can do. And all of a sudden, this lamb comes over to this wolf, and it does this and gives the wolf its neck. Now the wolf, when the wolf bit the neck, that's when I was coming out of the bed because I was fixing to put a whooping on the wolf. And that's when Ann screamed and yelled and, and uh, sometimes I get violent in these dreams. It, it's real to me. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that is. There's something, this is so powerful. And God didn't really show me this until today. This morning while I was in prayer, he said, you know, Rusty, he said, that's how the Lamb of God gave himself up. He gave himself up. I'm going to tell you, I've never seen anything like this in my life. That wolf came over and literally the Lamb offered its neck to him. And I'm going to tell you, that wolf thought he won. That wolf thought he had a lamb. But I'm going to tell you everything in my power. I was going to take that lamb back from that wolf. Let me tell you, Jesus is the lamb of God. There's a thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life. I've come to give you life more abundantly. And when that price was paid, and how many of you know there was a price that was paid? Why? Because your value is so great. The Bible says if one person gets saved, heaven rejoices. The angel rejoices over what? Over one person. Jesus came to die for the world. He came to die for the lost. And when he won, he triumphed over him in it. In Colossians 2, 13, it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
has he quickened together with him. The Greek word there for quicken means to make alive, to make alive. And you who were dead, do we have anybody here that was dead in their sins? Dead in their trespasses, the uncircumcision, the ugliness of your flesh and your sin. Has he made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all of your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting that was on the wall, the ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us. He took them and he nailed them to the tree. He nailed them to the cross. He removed them forever and ever. How did he do that? He died for you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he who knew no sin became sin. That's why he cried on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Because God turned his back, and Jesus went to hell, and he paid a price. He offered his neck. He gave. He died, as the Bible talks about, a lamb going to the slaughterer. He died, and he took that place. We were dead in our sins, but he quickened us. And we'll talk about that word. He made us alive. Who, who did he quicken us with? He quickened him together with him. You see, when God determined the price was paid, boom, God quickened Jesus. Jesus wasn't down there fighting the devil. He was powerless at that point in that time. He was our sin. He was made to be our sin. He died for us. And then God redeemed him. The scripture says he spoiled principalities, spoiled. That means the Greek word there to strip off. He stripped them off. Principality comes from the word arche or ark, which we get archangel from. Powers is the word authorities. He oversaw every one of them. And Colossians 2, 13, and being dead in your sins and uncircumcision, he quickened us together with him. And then he triumphed over them, the Bible says. Now, for, for those of you that are historians, you know what a triumph is. How many of you know what a triumph is? Raise your hand. There's quite a few of you. You hear me preach on it. A triumph is a parade. It happened all the time in old Roman times when they would conquer a king, conquer a city, take a territory. They would bring the king in. The king would come first. He would be all shackled, and he'd be walking behind the chariot and the war horses. And then after him would come a parade of the animals, the unique things, the gold, the stuff, everything that they surrendered everything they took as captivity. They brought it into Rome and they showed it off and said, we got another king, we got another kingdom, we got all their goods, we got all their gold, we got all their silver. And then they would bring their women in and their people in. We've made slaves out of all of these. This is what Jesus did. This is the picture that Isaiah spoke of when he said, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up. Why? Because the king would take the coat off of the king. How many of you know a king's got this big flowing robe that he wears? And you know the more powerful you are, the longer your train is. Mm, what did Isaiah say? He said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. That means he conquered every demon, every power of hell, every power of darkness, every arche, every onama, every power there was. He conquered, and he attached that to his train. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus took a strut around hell with every demon bowing and every demon declaring he is Lord and he is King. And now get this. And he quickened us together with him. That word quickened means made alive. When he was made alive, we were made alive. And then he set captivity captive. He set captivity free. Wednesday night I talked about this. God has been making this place called heaven. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am there you may be also. Up until that point in time, heaven had never been occupied. How many of you know Jesus is preparing a place for you? In my father's house. Or many mansions. It's in his house. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, realize when Jesus set captivity captive, when he set them free, and they all came into heaven, I'm going to tell you, I saw a big smile and a big shout on God's face. Why? Because he's been preparing a place, relationship with you, before the foundations of the earth, because Christ was slain before the foundations. Before he made you, he prepared something for you. He knows you by name, and he calls you into a glorious inheritance. But in Ephesians, we're looking about the inheritance of God. Whoa, you mean God has an inheritance? 
Yes, me and you. Whoa, can you see God's face when heaven fills up with its saints, when Abraham's bosom was released and Christ offered the sacrifice? You see, what's so unique about Christ was he was both the high priest and the sacrifice. Amen. You see, the high priest would bring the sacrifices. The problem with the high priest was they kept dying. And so Jesus came as the last high priest, and he was also the last sacrifice. When he poured his blood out upon the holy of holies in heaven, the price was paid, redemption was won, he was raised up, he was quickened, he triumphed over the devil. You see, Jesus was winning it all, he was winning it for man. But man, the Bible says, was made a little lower than the angels for death. How many of you realize, angels and man, man was made, the Bible says, a little lower than the angels. But the thing was is that there was this guy named Satan and he ruled the earth and, and he had power and he had authority, but you know what? Satan didn't want to serve man. Satan doesn't want to serve, Satan wants to be served. And so he got rebellious and he got this mind and this attitude that he would be better than God and he would lift himself up above God. And when he fell, this is Jesus saying, I saw that dude, he fell like light from heaven. I saw him fall. And this is what's so amazing. Is the angel that was supposed to serve man rebelled against God. And then the creator, hear me, the creator, the one that made us said, I'll serve the man. I'll serve the man. I'll become like one of them. I'll be born through a woman. I'll be perplexed. I'll be tempted. And I'll give my life. I'll serve the man. And Jesus came, not as the greatest, not as the best, although he was. He was all of those things. He came and he served us. The Bible says he humbled himself and that he made himself of no reputation. While men are trying to build a reputation, Jesus was making himself of no reputation. And he humbled himself even to the death of the cross. He came to serve. Why? Because he saw that man was powerless against Satan. And so he came to restore and return the power back where the last Adam, the first Adam, had lost it. He's to be celebrated. All spiritual authority comes through the name of Jesus, the power of sonship, the new creation, the blood of of the lamb and we need to preach more on the blood the testimony of our mouth the word that was sent to heal us you see the battle's never been between god and satan it's always been between man and satan and jesus the earthly christ the heavenly lord master and savior of all came to do something for us in us and through us but this is what you've got to understand get this please get this do not be one of those crazy charismatics that fights the whole devil all the devils we're fighting them all the time listen to me but we don't fight every devil I knew because all the verses I didn't have time, but I had this wonderful WrestleMania illustration I was going to show you. Amen. <laughs> Those guys are crazy. And in the parking lot at WrestleMania, they were jumping off of cars and, you know, landing on people and doing They're like crazy. That's crazy stuff. Sometimes Christians are like that. You know, we get to praying and we think, I'm fighting every devil in the universe. No, you're not. The only devils you're responsible for are the ones that are in your life. That's good. Yeah. Jesus conquered every devil. You stand up there and take a First of all, let me tell you something about the devil. He's not everywhere all the time. He's in one place at a time. He's not omnipotent. He's not omniscient. He doesn't see everything, know everything, rule everything. Are there some devils? Yeah, there's some devils probably in your life. God's given you responsibility and power over those demons. But let's not just get crazy. I mean, when Jesus cast legion out, 
Legion said, you know, send us to the pigs. Why didn't Jesus say, well, Legion, you and all those devils, I send you to the outermost place of darkness, never to be seen or heard from again. Because they had rights. They had a right to be here. And Jesus cast them into the swine. You know the story, the swine ran over the edge of the cliff and killed themselves. Remember, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. There's devils right there in your life. And Jesus has given you authority. Jesus has given us authority through sonship. Jesus, the very first demon he ever cast out in the Bible, I want you to know it was in church. You say, well, surely there's not any demons in this church. I hope there is. Why? Because we're reaching sinners. Right. Amen. 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 I've never been to a good church that didn't have sinners in it. And so if you're a sinner, I hope you're very comfortable here this morning. I want to welcome you. If you're the town drunk, I'll open the door for you. But I know a life that is better. I know a way that is better. I know where you can take power over every one of those demons that demonize you in your life. When you can't get along with anybody, when it's all the world's fault, when it's all the... Maybe, maybe there's something in common here. Addictions. Divorce. Rebellion. Can't keep a job. I mean, you can just go on and on and on. Ephesians 6, I'm going to get ready to close. I didn't say I was closing. I said I'm getting ready to close. Ephesians 6, it says finally. You know, we're doing a reculture series. I've been breaking Ephesians down verse by verse. Ephesians is the second doctrinal book but it's a book about the church and the understanding of the church it's a sister book to colossians ephesians is about the church colossians is about the head of the church and he says finally this greek word for finally is very interesting because finally means at the forming of an end at the forming of an end finally he says be strong finally so you see after you've ephesians 1 2 3 4 and 5 now you can ephesians 6 but we got people trying to jump into Ephesians 6 and they're not good husbands. I'm going to tell you, the devil beat the hell out of you. If you're not Ephesians 5 and don't be trying to fight all these demons. It, you know, there's something powerful in, about being a, a, a boss or about being an employee. There's something powerful in this. But when you get to the finally, he's saying finally. Now, he said, now I'm really getting to what I want to get to. This is what I really wanted to get to, but I had to tell you all of this because this is what the church is about. He said, finally. He said, put on the whole armor of God. You know, armor is for close combat. It's not for distance. You think you're fighting a devil in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? That devil doesn't even know you're in Sealy, Texas. But the ones up close, up close, no. And God says, I'm going to equip you. He said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The armor. Let me ask you, whose armor is it? It's God's armor. You remember David refused the king's armor because it didn't fit. Well, it wasn't his armor. This is armor God's made for you. Against all of the methods, the methodia of the devil. For we wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, rulers, rulers of darkness, spiritual beings in high places. This is where we fight. This is your fight. You might be mad at somebody and mad at their flesh, but let me tell you, there's a bigger fight going on around you. You see, the devils crucified Jesus, but they wouldn't had they had known. The Jews didn't crucify him. The Romans didn't crucify them. him. Why? Because Jesus said this, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. What does that mean? There's a method that was in operation. There was something working in the Jews and the Romans. The Jews did not kill Jesus. The devil killed him. And I'm going to say this to you this morning. You might be doing things that's not you. The devil's doing it. Do you all hear me right now? I mean, sometimes you ask yourself, why did I do that? And it happens lots of times. Like I said, I could get really gruesome and gross with telling you the stories from death row, the stories with which we baptized our first murderer three weeks ago. Amen. A man the governor let out who, who murdered people. I've got, I've got 
I've got 6,000 friends that are murderers. And to hear them tell the story, but I'm not going to tell you the story, but I'm going to tell you what they always say after. Pastor, I don't know why I did that. I can't believe I did that. Now, of course, they know now they were under a power. I have one friend, he went into a bar and he killed everybody in the bar. And then he came outside, sat down and called and turned himself in. Why did you do that? I don't know. Let me tell you, don't you for one moment believe the devil is not real. And he will mess you up. And he has methods that he has schemed against you. Methods to destroy your family. Methods to destroy your life. Methods to make you depressed. Methods to run after everything that's not going to fill you. Methods that mess you up. And if you can't even recognize it's the devil, you're going to believe it's you. And then you're going to believe you're a sorry piece of poop that shouldn't even belong or exist in this world. I'm going to tell you, God made you. And he made you good. And he made you after his image. And he put his spirit inside of you. And he said, take my power. He said, you can win with this. Take my love. You can love the world with this. Take my forgiveness. You can forgive with this. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'm going to tell you, some of you right now, you need to forgive some people right now. They may have wronged you, but forgive them because they know not what they do. You're fighting with your cousin, your aunt, your uncle, your husband, your wife, your child. It's not them. Let them off the hook. Stinking devil. Am I helping you this morning? He said, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day. And then I love this, and I'm not going to preach the rest of it out. I'll use that later, but he says, I love this. He said, and having done all to stand. Let me point a picture to you. This is like, man, I tell you what, I've been fighting, I've been fighting, I'm so tired, I'm so weary. I just want, having done all to stand, he said, stand anyway. Don't you sit down. Don't you give up. Don't you quit. Yeah. Big old sissy. Get up and stand. Put the armor of God on. Determine that no devil formed against you is going to whoop you. No devil formed against you is going to destroy you. No devil's going to take your family. No devil's going to take your daughter. No devil's going to take your marriage. No devil's going to... Push his abortion upon you. Push his addiction upon you. Push all, it's all about me, 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 me. When God gets inside of you, you are created for the world. You are made to give. For God so loved that he gave. He gave. He loves you. And I'm going to tell you, you can be a Christian and on your way to heaven and be getting the hell beat out of you here on earth. It doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. You see, to, to go to heaven, we do nothing. Jesus did everything. But you know what I find? And, and I am going to close with this. So start thinking. This, wrap this up. I find that a lot of people want citizenship. How many of you know that... that, that True citizenship has rights. There's a right as a citizen. That's the difference between Peter and Paul. Peter wasn't a citizen. Where he stayed and how he was executed was entirely different than Paul, who was a citizen and had rights. And he said, oh, by the way, I'm a citizen of Rome. I'm a Jew. Peter didn't have those rights because he wasn't a citizen. You see, we want the citizenship, the rights of heaven, but a lot of times we'd rather be a citizen than be an ambassador. Didn't the Bible tell us that we were made to be ambassadors of Christ? Not citizens. Some of you are living like a citizen instead of living like an ambassador. Now an ambassador is somebody that works for his nation. But I'm going to tell you the ambassador lives in a really nice house. The ambassador eats really well. The ambassador throws really good parties, but he also works. 
I'm telling you, some of you just get this change of mentality here to realize that God has called you to be an ambassador in his kingdom. Demons have no rights. They're not citizens of that kingdom. But I'm going to tell you, sometimes we let the devil move into our brain and we don't even charge him rent. He lives up there free. And you become more of an ambassador of him than an ambassador of heaven. Does somebody need some freedom today? Does somebody need some power? We prayed for somebody just a few weeks ago. We prayed and, and, and bound and rebuked a lot of things. This is weird. You're going to say that's weird. Let me tell you what happened to them. They began to see colors and things they had never seen before. They said, my goodness, I'm seeing with my physical eye. I'm hearing things I haven't heard. I'm seeing things that I've never seen. You see, the devil will box you in and he will blind you. He will blind you. And you won't even recognize or realize the blessings of God. God, bless me. But God, don't just bless me for me. Bless me so that you can use me. Bless me so I can take some of those silly blue eggs and give to people. You don't know that homeless guy might end up on the cross and he gets saved on Sunday morning. Whoa, pastor, me too. Well, dude, you just messed my whole sermon up, but okay. <laughs> get saved. Because if I can get people to see God is so good. Romans 2, 4, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. If I can just get them to see his goodness, they'll choose him every time. Every time. Will you help me? Will you help me reach the lost? Will you help me to be a light set upon a hill? Will you take and receive authority for the demons that you fight? You know, spiritual warfare, don't come in here in church and pull down. We pull down all those demons in Russia. Those demons in Russia don't even know who you are. But they knew who Paul was. They knew who Jesus was. I had one instance where I cast several demons out of a lady. She, she happened to be walking. She was hitchhiking. And one of the members of our church pulled over and stopped and picked her up. She got in the car. She got in the car and she turned and she looked and a male voice came out of her and said, you're not going to have me. You can't have me. And she said, oh, that's about far enough. You can get out here. <laughs> Scared her to death. She called the church and anyway, make a long story short, when I walked in the room, the devil cried out my name. And I said, even hell knows who I am. I said, devil, you're going to go in Jesus' name. Cast seven devils out of her. One of them, to tell you what happened in her life, uh, one of them was a spirit of witchcraft. One of them was a spirit of prostitution. Her daughters and grandchildren were in prostitution. She was involved in witchcraft. Let me tell you today that one of her daughters is a pastor. Amen. Let me tell you, the whole family was set free. You see, there's stuff around you. Just because you don't always see it, you don't see it with this eye. But God's given you power and authority. Now, if you've had hell in your house, let's just run the devil out. Yeah. Ann and I, we've done this a few times. We did this early in our marriage where we'd go to the door, open up the door, and we'd kick the devil out. Devil, you gotta go. You can't stay here. You gotta go. If there's hell going on in your family, your children, we gotta bind the devil. We gotta bind those powers that are heavy influencers. You know, when we drink, we sometimes talk about being under the influence. Well, I'm going to tell you, you can drink from the water of Christ, or you can drink from the polluted water. They're both going to influence you. Does anyone here, you say, Pastor, I need prayer today. Just raise your hand. I'm not going to call you forward. Just say, I need prayer today. I've got issues. I've got things. You know, a lot of times sickness is one of those issues. You know, I've been paralyzed from my waist down, second and third degree burns, lips were burned off. And we found actually, uh, my wife digging through, found a clip in the paper when I, was, when I was burned. You know, God's a healer. I've got no scars. Guess what? I have lips. My wife thinks they're beautiful. <laughs> I have tear ducts now. I didn't have any tear ducts. Doctor said I'd never move my fingers or hands, said I'd never grow hair on my body. 
malignant melanoma cancer. The doctor gave me seven months to live. Diabetes as a child, childhood diabetes, first thing God ever healed me of. What else? Oh, blind, I was blind in one eye. I've had so much stuff, i got to document it and go back through it. Blind, doctor said, you'll never see out of that eye. The only thing I could tell is if the lights were on or the lights were off. I couldn't see any person or images. 2020 vision. He's a good God. Amen. And he's not a respecter of persons. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, I'm just not, not going to lie to you. I'm real special, okay? I am. <laughs> but you got to realize that you're special. Do you know John, when John would write about himself in John's gospel or epistle, he would say, yeah, yeah, I'm John. I'm the disciple Jesus loved. <laughs> he, he loved them all, right? But you got to know that about you. There's something special about you. Briley, there's something special about you. I keep telling her, girl, you're special. I like to tell people why. There's something special about you. God made you for a purpose and a reason. Don't spend all your time on this junk. Find your purpose and your reason. I am a Christian. I do this. I do that. But I have a purpose and I have a reason. And my purpose for life is people. You are my purpose. You are my reason. I'm here and I say, God, wear me like a coat. Put me on and wear me out. Pour me out. Use me. God, I want to see life, and I want to see people up their life. I want to see them live in the freedom that you came to give us. If you don't know Jesus this morning, I'm going to give you the chance to be saved. There's only one way to be saved. There's not any other ways. And Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me in front of men, he said, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my Father. There's one way to get saved. And that's where you confess and you ask him to forgive you and to come into your heart. And when you do that, the game changes. Jesus said, you are quickened. You are made to life. He came to give you life, to give you his life and abundantly. And instead of you running from the devil, it's time for the devil to run from you. Is there anyone here this morning, very quickly, I'm going to pray, but very quickly say, Pastor, I want to be saved. Thank you. Hands. Any other hands? I'm looking. Thank you, sir. I see your hand, too. Thank you. I see your hand, too. Anyone else? Remember, the heaven rejoices when one gets saved. Thank you. I see both of y'all's hands. Thank you. Two more. Let me tell you, the weight. Thank you. I see that one. The weight on your hand is the devil sitting on it. If you just push him over, it'll go up. Worst thing in the world the devil wants is for you to come here and get saved because he might have to leave your house. This is powerful stuff. Anybody else? Even one more. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And you've been working hard, too. You've been going after God. It's going to get a lot easier after today. You know, sometimes we go hard after God. And it's so much easier when we let God go hard after us. Let's pray this together, prayer. This prayer, I'm going to pray for all of you, but let's pray this together. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to come into my heart. I believe there's a life change when I receive you as my Savior. And to have you as Savior, I must have you first as Lord. Come and be the master of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Heal my wounded heart. And make me one with you. As a child of God, I'm your son or daughter. Thank you for loving me and choosing me. Amen. Amen. Y'all put your hands together. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Now, now, let me tell you, I'm going to close. I'm really closing. I've been closing for a while. This is it. When Jesus commanded Lazarus to be raised from the dead, Lazarus was not raised based upon how loud Jesus was yelling. Now, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm not telling you not to ever get loud. I'm telling you that if you pray quiet, it's not a prayer because every prayer in the Bible was spoken. Yeah, I used to always 
get a kick out of this. People say, I have an unspoken prayer request. Then you have nothing. Prayer was always spoken. And so the speaking comes from God's word. He's the word of God, and he puts his word in our heart. And the Bible says he watches over his word to perform it. He didn't say he watched over Lauren Frank's word to perform it. He said he watches over God's word to perform it. And so God's word can come out of the mouth of Lauren Frank. And when the word of God comes forth, he has obligated himself to us because he performs all of his words. So when it comes to ruling over demons, ruling over principalities, and, and I'm not going to go through, there's a whole list and a whole line. Oh, a bunch of these devils are so weak, they got nothing. I mean, they got nothing. Jesus. The Bible says demons fear and tremble. Jesus, just the mention of his name. You see, when you've had the snot beat out of you, like they have already experienced in hell when Jesus came to power, it, he didn't have to go around physically and fight with them. He didn't have to go around and yell at every one of them. That power was intrinsic. It's the iscus power that came upon him. And he said, I'm giving you that power. That when you speak, when you speak, now, some of you, you need to tell the devil to get out of your house. You need to bind the devil. Remember, the things that are bound on earth are bound in heaven. The things that are loosed in heaven are loosed on earth. So you have to bind something and loose something. You don't just bind without loosing because if you don't put something in its place, something else comes in its place. And so I bind you, devil, in the name of Jesus, and I loose the blessings of God. I thank you, God, for favor. and I thank you for giving me entrance into the things of God. I thank you, Lord, that I walk into your favor and that I also have your honor and your authority because I serve you. So how many of you right now, you just want to pray for some things in your life? Let me tell you, this includes your business, includes your home, it includes your school, it includes your family, it includes all of this. Because I want to pray for you right now. And I want you to pray. I'm not just praying for you. I want to pray with you. Jesus told the 70, you go and then come back to me. And they went back and said, my goodness, the demons were subject to us in your name. Yeah, because he had the authority. Father, we rise right now and we take every authority over principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. We declare this day freedom and life. We bind every spirit of wickedness. We bind a spirit of divorce and addiction. We bind a rebellious spirit, Lord. We bind all rebellion. Rebellions as a sin of witchcraft. We bind that right now. We bind it. And we thank you, Lord, for healing. We thank you for power. We thank you for authority that you give to us, Lord. My friend Doug Stringer said this yesterday. He said, too often society attempts to solve a problem that stems from intrinsic and systemic irresponsibility without dealing with the root causes. Sometimes you've got problems, you're trying to fix a problem. You can't fix a problem if you don't kill the roots. You can't fix a problem that's intrinsic and systematic based upon faulty root system. I bind the devil. When I had cancer, I bound that cancer every day. I got up and I talked to it like it was a man. You would have thought I was having a conversation with a man. Cancer, how dare you come into my body? I bind you in the name of Jesus. You've got no right to be in here. I pronounce death over you, and I'm going to live. And you know what? I had to keep believing that, keep speaking that, keep saying that. I fought every single day. spirit of death that tries to take you out I bind that spirit of death in Jesus name now I knew all the healing verses y'all know that I said I quote them to you left and right but until it comes out of here instead of out of here it doesn't do you any good I'm connected with him in my spirit father we just take authority right now in Jesus name I pray over marriages I pray over homes I pray right now and I bind every spirit of confusion. The devil often brings great confusion. Confusion is not of God. I bind that confusion right now in Jesus' name. I bind it right now. There's people right now, your brain, right now I'm just praying that your brain will receive some, some insight from God. 
There's some of you right now, you're making decisions and you're coming to things and there's been just a spirit of confusion. That's not you. That's confusion trying to work on you. Just tell that spirit to go right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Remember, God's not given you a poor mind. He's given you a powerful and a sound mind. He's not letting death rule in you. He's letting life rule in you and through you. And so, Father, we thank you today that we receive from you the pure water, the pure milk of your word. And we thank you, Father, as you heal us and you help us grow. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.